Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we'll read the Lord's Prayer once again, beginning at verse 9 to verse 13. Our focus tonight is on the second petition in verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 9, that's page 811 in your pew Bible. Our Lord is speaking and he says, Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Lord, even now as we come before your word, we are aware of the myriad of temptations that lie before us, our own distractions, even those distractions that Satan himself would place in our midst. Lord, we pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil, that we might receive the true blessing of your word. Work mightily, Lord God, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. What we saw last week and the week before as we began to work through the Lord's Prayer, the basic division of the prayer is as follows. Three petitions after a a preface introduction, three petitions pertaining to God, His glory, His kingdom, and His will, followed by three petitions pertaining to our needs. We come now to the second petition found in verse 10, Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. And as we pray this prayer, and as we consider matters of the kingdom, we ought to really be keenly aware as Christians that as members of the kingdom of Christ, we are constantly at war with another kingdom, a real kingdom, a dark kingdom, a kingdom with real and significant powers, And these two kingdoms are constantly at war. The kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan always have been and always will be at war until our Lord comes again. Now, we know the outcome of the war. The war has already been won at the cross. And yet the battles, the skirmishes are still continuing, are they not? And those battles and skirmishes between the two kingdoms actually produce real casualties of war. Those who once were of us but are no longer of us, who appear to have left the kingdom of Christ and joined in some way the kingdom of darkness, we know the battle goes on and that we individually, Each one of us as Christians here tonight are involved in that daily battle. It can be no other way. If you are a true, sincere Christian, you belong in a kingdom that has declared war on the kingdom of Satan. We are at war then. We pray then, your kingdom come. We're praying for the prospering of the kingdom of which we, by God's grace, are a part, the advancement of that kingdom. We're praying firstly for spiritual realities and principally spiritual realities, but in time, those spiritual realities give way or perhaps bring about physical realities, material realities. We say Christ's kingdom is spiritual. Yes, it is, but it's physical as well. We're here tonight in a physical building with physical bodies, We will physically die one day and be raised from the dead, and we will dwell in a physical new heavens and new earth. There is a physical and material component to Christ's kingdom now and in eternity, but principally we are thinking of spiritual realities, spiritual, unchanging, and eternal realities. We are called then to pray for the advancement of the kingdom of God. 
And we ought to be zealous to see the rule of Christ and the kingdom of God extend not only in our own lives and in our own hearts, but also in the lives of those that do not yet know Christ, that they may, as we have by God's grace, bow the knee to Almighty God. So then, as we come to pray this second petition, we need to be aware of several matters. The first is this. You can see in your outline that we have here a tale in this petition, a tale of two kingdoms which are at war. Two kingdoms which are at war. Secondly, then we'll see the coming of the kingdom. Your kingdom come, we pray. We'll see the coming of the kingdom with Christ. And then we'll see the coming of the kingdom through prayer. So let's first of all look at the tale of two kingdoms at war. It's fairly obvious to, I suspect, all of us who are Christians that we are in a kingdom, and that kingdom faces significant opposition, and frequently it looks like the kingdom of which we are a part is losing the battle. It looks like, I say, that our kingdom is losing the battle. If you were to take a snapshot of the kingdom and its strength today, and then a snapshot of the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of Satan, we would be slightly concerned, I suspect, about the outcome of this war if we did not already know the outcome that Christ has accomplished. And we see this battle, this, this fight, this ongoing enmity between the kingdoms as we look at society. Uh, the, the tidal wave of secularism, uh, of humanism in the West, uh, the relativization or the abandonment of morality, a state taking too much role in the lives of the individual, the breakup of homes, destruction of marriage, all of which, plus many more ills, all of which leads to greater societal, economic, and political disorder, not to mention the spiritual carnage which is attached to all those troubles. And these things don't just happen. We are surrounded by these things so much now that we can take them for granted. These things don't just happen. They're part of Satan's campaign against the Lord and against his anointed and against the church of Christ. We see this very clearly in Scripture. Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves... And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords. They don't want the cords of God, the restraining bonds of God, upon them. And they take counsel. They plot, seeking to overthrow God, seeking to overthrow his Christ, seeking to overthrow the church, we're talking now again about Satan-sponsored rebellion. Satan-sponsored rebellion and Satan-incited rebellion. And it has ever been thus. It has ever been thus from the first pages of Scripture, with the exception of one or two, to the last pages of Scripture, with the exception of one or two. We see this battle of two kingdoms from start to finish. We see it in the garden, don't we? Satan comes in in an attempt to overthrow God's creation. He comes in as one kingdom, one representative of one kingdom, against the representative of another kingdom, Adam, seeking to derail God's will in his life. And from his own perspective, he succeeds. But when we see God doling out the curse, both to the woman and also to Satan, what do we observe? we observe the promise that the seed of the woman would bruise or crush the seed of the serpent. We have the seed of the woman, and we have the seed of the serpent, and you can trace those two lines throughout the entirety of Scripture. Here's just a sample of those two lines, those two seeds, those two kingdoms warring against each other. Cain of the line and seed of Satan kills Abel who loved the Lord. Esau despised his birthright, sold it to Jacob. 
the Egyptians persecuted Israel. The Canaanite kings fought against the people of God. Goliath came against David. Saul came against David. Absalom came against David. The Philistines came against David. Fast forward in history a few years, Sanballat and Tobias seeking to cast down the wall as they rebuilt Jerusalem. Fast forward again, the Pharisees and Christ, the chief priest and Christ, the scribes and Christ, Judas and Christ. Ananias and Sapphira on one side, the church on the other, Hymenaeus and Alexander against Paul, and the list goes on and on and on. Two kingdoms, two seeds, constantly at war. The seed of Satan seeking to overthrow the seed of Christ. The seed of the woman who is Christ, rather. We've seen this battle time and time again. Scarcely there is a page of Scripture you could turn to where you cannot in some way identify this ongoing war and battle. Ultimately, we know the end of the war. We know the end of the story from its beginning in a sense because Christ has come. Christ has established his kingdom And he has cast down Satan, bound him, overthrown him, where? At the cross. And Scripture says that Christ's death on the cross is reckoned to be for him a bruising of his heel. That is to say, he was bruised. But it's a bruising of his heel. Satan's overthrow is referenced as a crushing of his head. And so we know the end from the beginning. We know how this war plays out in history, but there are still casualties along the way. You see, we see this satanic line in two places principally. We see it in the world. There are obvious enemies at one level. There are obvious enemies, whether it's the Canaanites, the Philistines, or Satan himself, and so on. But the reality as we read Scripture is we often see this kingdom of Satan, uh, the seed of Satan, We find it surprisingly but worryingly in the church. Cain, Esau, Saul, Absalom, the Jewish leaders who put our Lord to death. Why Christ even called the Pharisees? He said, you are of your father the devil. It doesn't get much more explicit than that. We see then that we're in a kingdom which is at war, at war from within, and at war from within without when we think about this kingdom of christ of which we are a part of which we are praying about at this moment or thinking about at this moment we often think of that kingdom of christ as being a kingdom of light and of peace and of joy but it's also a kingdom of justice and a kingdom of warfare there's a famous political phrase i think it goes all the way back to or at least an idea Emperor Hadrian. Uh, Certainly we saw Ronald Reagan use it in his presidency. He spoke of peace through strength. That doctrine of peace through strength. We will have peace with our enemies because we are so mighty. Economically, militarily, we are so mighty. Our enemies will make peace with us. And so it proved in Reagan's time. But often what that transpires to be is not just peace through strength, but peace through war. And such it is with the kingdom of Christ. Peace through war. Psalm 2 verse 4, he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision and he'll speak to them in wrath and terrify them in his fury. And he'll say to them, now therefore kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest He be angry and you perish in the way. Notice what He's done there. The Lord has addressed those who are in active rebellion to Him saying, Take heed. The time is coming when you will be crushed. And such is your rebellion. So insignificant is it to the Lord Almighty. He sits in heaven and laughs. There's going to be a crushing. But you'll notice what the psalm has done before 
the crushing, the destroying, there's a plea, a cry, a call to those who are the kings of this earth. Kiss the sun, make peace, do obeisance to him, honor him, glorify him, make peace with him. You see what's happening in that psalm? There's the promise of judgment, of wrath and destruction, but before that there's the plea of grace. Kiss the sun, make peace, find Christ and find life. His wrath is quickly kindled, but blessed are all who take refuge in him. You see, I think, I think, brethren, when we pray thy kingdom come, we need to keep the paradigm of Psalm 2 before us. God will rise up and scatter his enemies. God will do it. And we can pray for that in reality, but not, I say again, before we pray for the conversion of our enemies. Our Lord Jesus says we're to love our enemies. Scarcely then can we pray for their destruction before we pray for their conversion. You see, that's how the kingdom advances, by the overthrowing of wickedness, but principally through the spiritual overthrowing of wickedness, through the gospel of grace piercing people's hearts. When Christ came, he brought with him a kingdom. That's very clear. The kingdom came when Christ came. Came. That's our second consideration then. We've seen that the kingdoms are at war. They always will be until he comes again. But at his first coming, he came heralding and inaugurating a kingdom. As we look at this prayer in Matthew's gospel, we need to remember it's not just a standalone treatise on how to pray. It's actually in the context of Matthew's gospel. It's in the context of the Sermon on the Mount the sermon preached by the one who Matthew has spent five chapters or four chapters laboring to express who this one is. And particularly, Matthew has focused upon the kingship of Christ. We go back to the genealogy of chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. He's of royal blood. He's a king. And we see that king will come with a mission in the 21st verse. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, this king is no ordinary king. If he were, our kingdom would not be great. Our kingdom would not overcome the kingdom of Satan. Because as you look at the kingship in the history of Israel, it's not got an awful lot to endear it to us. Matthew records of this king, first that he's born of the Holy Spirit, verse 18 of chapter 1, and then this king is also called God's son. That is to say, this Messiah is no ordinary man. He is no ordinary king. Christ's kingship and his kingdom are seen, I think, through two distinct lenses. There's the general rule and reign of Christ, which is universal. We're talking there about the realm of common grace, uh, how God uh, rules over all things and all people and his providential dealings in this world keep this world going. There's a general rule of King Jesus, but there's also a special rule, a special reign. That reign is characterized by grace and mercy and also warfare and judgment. This reign is inaugurated by Christ at his first coming, consummated, brought fully to pass at his second coming. But it's his first coming that we're concerned with principally this evening as we pray this prayer, thy kingdom come. When our Lord Jesus Christ came, he came with a kingdom. Why? Because he's a king. And he said these words, Matthew 4, verse 17, the first public words of our Lord recorded in Matthew's gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That tells us immediately that this kingdom is a spiritual kingdom because repentance is the condition for entering into this kingdom. Moreover, our Lord came with the gospel of the kingdom, verse 23 of the same chapter. 
He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And the counterpart of teaching and proclaiming the gospel was what? And healing every disease and every affliction among the people, spiritual and physical. You see, with Christ's coming, the kingdom is ever more so clear. Yes, there's a kingdom in the Old Testament, most certainly, but it's ever more so clear at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He comes with spiritual blessings, afresh and anew in Him. Not in types or in shadows or promises, but in Him Himself. And as He does these remarkable signs, He always holds before people that the kingdom is not just about physical blessing, but principally about spiritual realities. Why is this important? Because it tells us the nature of the prayer, Thy kingdom come. It tells us the nature of this prayer. If we say that the nature of the kingdom is principally spiritual, but also physical, then it ought to also ought to be in our own prayer lives. But I said it's a gospel of grace. I said he comes with a kingdom uh, of, of mercy, but also of warfare and judgment, even in the gospels. Think back to John the Baptist, the herald of Christ, chapter 3 of Matthew's gospel. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? See, King Jesus brings wrath for those who reject him. The coming of the kingdom for those who do not know Christ, who do not love Christ, is a terrible matter. It's awesome in the true sense of that word. A kingdom of grace and mercy for some, but a kingdom of judgment and of wrath and destruction now then is the time to change your allegiance if you're walking not with the lord now is the time to change your allegiance because our lord may come back tomorrow and we might not have tomorrow to repent now tonight is the time to be part of the kingdom of christ jesus how by his own words repent For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, the kingdom came with our Lord. And it is that kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. They're synonymous essentially in this respect. That's what we're praying for when we say, Thy kingdom come. That which Christ brought with him and he embodies as its king, we're praying for that to advance. What's remarkable is that our Lord says that we are to pray for its advance. That tells us that God has ordained the coming of the kingdom, not just in Christ, but through prayer. God has ordained the coming and growth and advancement of the kingdom through your prayers. Not causally, of course. Your prayers are not going to make the kingdom expand but because God has determined to answer the prayer of his children, and he says to you, when I tell you pray, my kingdom come, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to answer you. Remember Witsius' comment last week. He says the most wonderful thing of the Lord's Prayer, and one which almost exceeds belief, is that man should be allowed to plead, not only for himself or for his neighbor, but for God that the kingdom of God and the glory of God should be the subject of his prayer as if, as if God were unwilling to be glorious or to exercise his dominion except in answer to the prayers of believers. Does that not stagger you? 
as if God is unwilling to be glorious and to extend his rule, kingdom, and glory, except in answer to the prayers of believers. God can most certainly act outside of the prayers of his believers, and he most certainly does. He can act in extraordinary ways, outside of ordinary ways. He can act outside our prayers. But this passage tells us God will act through our prayers. Young children, do you understand this? That as you pray to God, He hears you and He will advance His kingdom step by step, piece by piece. Heart by heart, individual by individual. Have you got friends who don't know the Lord, young people? Friends who don't know the Lord, pray for them. Pray that the kingdom of grace, as we just said in the shorter catechism, may be advanced, ourselves and others brought into it. Pray. Pray. Trusting that God will act according to his wise and powerful will. God has told us, cry out to me and I will answer you. Cry out to me in accordance with my will. Your kingdom will come and I will do it. Is that not wonderful? Struggling for something to pray about? Pray your kingdom come. Pray your kingdom come in, in your own life. And in the lives of others, God has revealed to us here, brethren, that he desires to act in and through our prayers. And what's entailed in God acting? What does this look like? The Shorter Catechism, as you can see before you, has principally two ideas to this idea of thy kingdom come. One's the destruction of Satan. The other is the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. Luther also had a small catechism, uh, and interestingly, Luther, who had quite a beef with the devil, leaves out the casting down of Satan's kingdom and simply says, when you pray thy kingdom come, it means God's kingdom comes when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. The giving of the Spirit that we might live godly lives now and eternally. In short, brethren, when we pray this petition, we are praying then for the casting down of the strongholds of Satan, which appear at times to be great and mighty. But in God's eyes, they're nothing. There are specks of dust upon the scales of God's justice. Pray then for the evils and the, the wickedness of society all around us to be cast down. We'll come to what that looks like in a minute. Pray that Satan's kingdom will be destroyed and that the kingdom of Christ, which is principally the church, will go forward. Let me ask you, brethren, what are your prayers for this church? What are your prayers for the church abroad? But you're members of this church, are you not? For what do you pray for this church? Do you pray that the kingdom will be advanced by the ministries? And that's however many people there are tonight, the ministries of this church. It's important we understand that when we're talking about the casting down of Satan and the advancement of the kingdom, we're talking about in the world and in ourselves. In the world and in ourselves. When we're talking about the growth and advancement of the kingdom of Christ, we're talking about in the world and in ourselves. Consider these matters. As New Covenant Christians, we know and we live under Christ's kingly authority, His power, His rule, and His graces. The kingdom has already come. The kingdom has already come. I'll come back to that in a moment. It's yet to be complete. It's yet to be consummated. We're waiting for that final glory. We're not there yet. And so we pray then for the advancement of the kingdom of grace. That's what we confessed in the catechism, that the kingdom of grace may be 
advanced. From the outset, brethren, we need to understand that's a prayer of faith. And by that I mean it's a prayer of submission. You can only submit by faith. It's a prayer of submission. Why? Because we're asking for God's kingdom, not our kingdom. God's agenda, not our agenda, to be advanced. And that it will be done through spiritual means. Sinclair Ferguson writes this, Unlike the kings of this world, God establishes his kingdom through suffering, self-denial, and service. To pray for that kingdom means committing yourself to the way of the cross. That's how Christ established the kingdom. That's how he cast down Satan. That's what we're committing ourselves to. Don't put your trust in princes or in a son of man. Just don't do it. You're only going to be disappointed. Don't put your trust in education, in legislation, in economic strength, in warfare, none of which has ever changed the heart of a single person. Put your trust in Christ, in the means that he has ordained, which is why Paul prayed or asked the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3 to pray in this way. Uh, the, the advancement of the kingdom involves what spiritual means. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Notice the spiritual and physical again, that the word of the Lord will speed forth. Pray that in your own hearts. So as you go out of here, uh, back into your homes, your neighborhoods, your, your workplaces, uh, your sports clubs, wherever you go, that the Word will be part of you. That the Word will, in a sense, speed forth from you as you witness to Christ. Paul wants the Word to go forth freely. Oh, I'd ask you to pray for that as well. I'd ask you to pray for that here. That the word may go forth freely. It might speed forth. Speed ahead and be honored. So that brethren, not just we can receive the word of God. But those that do not know Christ can also hear the word. The word is life-giving. The word is sanctifying. The word is preserving. Those are genuine advances in the kingdom of Christ. Genuine advances. It's hard to see them sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to see the sanctification in a believer. We don't have meters on the side of our head how sanctified we are that week. We, we can't see whether somebody's up or down in their sanctification. But that's the advancement of the kingdom of Christ when we become more Christ-like. And the church plays an integral part, an integral role in this process of the advancement of the kingdom. Not in a causative sense, but as an instrument in the hands of God. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all generations and nations. God be gracious to us. So that God's name and saving power will be known throughout the world. So that we'll pray for our missionaries. We'll support our missionaries financially so they don't have to raise money for themselves. So that we, filled with the grace and the blessing and with the shining face of God looking down upon us, we will also be bold. We will be bold speaking to those that do not know Christ. The church, you see, plays an integral role in that process. Part of the spiritual dominion of, of the kingdom is the gospel then being propagated throughout the world. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies of the gospel going out to all the world. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, it's important to understand, brethren, the expansion of the kingdom has happened, past tense. 
I think there are some in the Reformed world who are still waiting for that seminal act where the, the floodgates of redemption have, have burst open. No, that's happened already. The life and death of Christ and his resurrection and his great commission has happened. Go therefore into all the world. New covenant Christianity is, is expansive. It's extroverted. It's outward looking. Go into all the world. Don't wait till they come to you. Go. As we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying, for example, that God would raise up laborers to go into the vineyard. We're praying that the kingdom of grace will so envelop our own hearts that we will be filled with the grace of God. That we will be overflowing with a zeal for evangelism and outreach, witness, care, love for our neighbors, love for those who do not know Christ. You see, brethren, if we pray this prayer with any sincerity and never open our mouths for the sake of Christ, at best we are inconsistent. At worst, we could be something much worse. You see, this is a calling on all Christians. Not all are called to be evangelists. Not all are called to be pastors or missionaries. But we are almost certainly all called to witness and testify to the truth and grace that resides in us. We also want to see, do we not, the church purged from corruption and sin. How do we see that? By each one of us taking heed to ourselves. Ensuring that the word permeates our own hearts, that we don't harden our hearts as we come in through those doors and shut our ears. Each one of you comes before God and I come before God to hear the word of God. Do we receive that? Do we seek to receive that word here and in our own lives, in families and in individual worship? You see, the Shorter Catechism says the kingdom of grace may be advanced in ourselves. We desire, ought we not desire to be like Christ? To serve the Lord as he served his Lord in kindness and compassion, tenderness to each other, love, forbearing with one another when we fail each other and when we fail the Lord. It's about being a good neighbor. In that sense, a Christian neighbor filled with love. It's about being a good colleague, a Christian colleague, a Christian family member. Willing to both act out the love of God and share the testimony of God. And finally, we want to see, do we not, the destruction of Satan. The destruction of Satan and his rule. We know that Satan was cast down at the cross. And one wonders why he continues to act in this world as he does. Well, Satan's the father of lies. And all liars, whatever else they may be, they are nearly always self-deceived. I think that Satan thinks he can still win the battle. When he thinks, when he sees him, when he sees he's picking off people from the church, rooting out the weak ones, seeking whom he may devour is the language of Scripture. I think he still thinks he can win the battle. And he might win individual battles. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. But we know at the cross Satan's powers were dealt a death blow. And look, God created Satan anyway. <laughs> he made that angel. It's not as if his powers ultimately will ever be victorious over the one who made him. There's victory over Satan and what he produces. There's victory over sin. There's victory over death. That which is unimaginable for us. Victory over death. The death blow has been delivered to Satan at the cross. 
and his lifeblood, such as it is, is slowly leaching out. May we hasten, may we hasten the day where he is thrown down. Don't forget the Apostle Paul says it's not long before the God, God will crush the, the head of Satan under your feet. How's that for union with Christ? God shall arise. His enemies shall be scattered and those who hate him shall flee before him. Psalm 68. So shall it be with Satan and all who align themselves with him. That's why, brethren, before we pray that awful prayer, God, arise and scatter your enemies, we ought to think back to the language of Psalm 2, which tells the nations there is an opportunity for escape. Kiss the Son. Pay honor to him. Bow before him. Repent of rebellion. Come to faith in Christ. Conversion. Conversion, I think, is a much greater offense to Satan than seeing one of his satanic strongholds cast down. Pray for the conversion of the lost. Do so under the rubric of thy kingdom come. And you see, ultimately, we're looking to the second coming of Christ, where all these things for which we have been praying, the myriad of elements that go into the kingdom today, will be brought into perfect relief. We'll see it clearly. And Christ shall come again with power and glory on the clouds, and shall raise the dead, some to life, others to death. There we see for those who love Christ, the spiritual and the physical will be perfectly aligned when our bodies raised from the dead and our spirits made perfect in holiness are reunited in glory. That's ultimately what we're praying for here. Where Satan, where sin, where death will be banished to the lake of fire forevermore. I say to you, friends... I think we have quite an incentive to pray these words. Thy kingdom come. Let's pray. Our great God, we do magnify your name. And we would not let these words escape us. Personally, familiarly, and corporately we cry out to you, Lord God, have mercy upon us that we, Lord God, might see your great kingdom advance in our own lives. We might find the things of earth growing strangely dim in the light of our Savior's glory and grace. O oh Lord, be merciful to us and be merciful to the church throughout this world, especially those of our brethren persecuted for the name of Christ. We do pray, Lord God, as you have done in the past, deliver their persecutors from their own sin. And if you will not do that, Lord, deliver our beloved brethren from their hands by whatever means. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.